Okay, so um, hello and thanks for staying with us. Um, my name is Ian Walsh. I'm a lecturer here in theatre studies at NUI Galway, and I have the great privilege of chairing this post-show discussion on finding sympathy and the exploration of performing personal narratives on stage. So, so just to uh, tell you that I'm joined today, not only by the creators of the, of the show, but also two uh, special guests. Uh, Noel, uh, Noelle uh, Brown, who is an actor and playwright, uh, her play Postscript, co-written with Michelle Forbes, uh, uh, and in which Noelle performs, was part of the Dublin Fringe Festival in 2013, um, and was nominated for the Fish Amble New Writing Award and the Bewley's Little Gem Award. Postscript toured Ireland for six weeks in 2014-2015 and then ended up in Paris. It had sold out run at the Abbey Theatre uh, in the Peacock uh, in June 2017. And in Postscript, uh, Noelle reveals how she was born in a mother and baby home in Cork in the 1960s, and she embarks on a journey to uncover her true identity and how church and state made every step so difficult. Her second play, Foxy, premiered at Project Arts Centre in October 2015. She was a writer on Dublin Youth Theatre's 24-hour plays at the Abbey in January 2017. And that same year, she presented Creaking, a piece that she co-created with Una Murphy that explores the discrepancies between the mental and physical effects of ageing through movement and text. In January 2017, Creaking was presented then as a stage reading at Newbridge Arts Centre as part of the first Fortnight Festival with Geraldine Plunkett in the central role. It then went on tour to Cork, Waterford, Sligo, Castle Bar, Clare, and then Dublin. And with director and co-creator uh, creator Una Murphy, Noel worked with groups of local volunteers at each venue. And the local volunteers then formed part of the cast of the stage reading with Geraldine Plunkett on the evening of the workshop. Our other special guest today is uh, Anne Blake. Anne Blake is a writer, director, performer, and musician from Limerick. From her band, the Brad Pitt Light Orchestra, her award-winning show, The Morning After the Life Before, her podcast with the Limerick Post, Anne and Steve Talk Stuff, and her activist work with marriage equality. Uh, Anne Blake is a star in every sense of the word. She's uh, also professional in many other fields, such as directing, performing, and improv with her group, uh, Choke Comedy and more now. Having taken her award-winning show, The Morning After the Life Before, uh, A Personal Tale of Ireland Before and After the Marriage Equality Referendum, from Limerick to as far as North America, Anne has taken her story and Ireland's to many different audiences. So also joining us, as I've already said, are the creators of today's performance, Ailish McDonough, uh, actress and recent alumni of BA Drama Theatre and Performance, and director Chloe Hales, a current uh, student of our BA Drama Theatre and Performance. And last but not least, uh, we have Ella Daly with us, uh, theatre producer, former general manager of Dublin Youth Theatre, judge for the Irish Times Theatre Awards, co-artistic director of Amalgam Ocean Theatre Company, and writer of The Light Lighthouse Keeper 2014, and of course the writer and performer of Finding Sympathy, which first had its premiere at Dublin Fringe Festival 2013 with Ella performing her story. Now Ella is currently writing a practice research PhD on rituals of loss uh, and the Irish family and this project is part of her research and I think she'll put a, a survey up after this as well if, you could, if you'd be so kind to uh, fill that out for us as well. There's the opportunity as well to fill out the survey I think when this goes on YouTube as well um, but I might maybe come back to that at the end of the discussion. So just to kick off, I guess, uh, today, uh, a personal narrative piece uh, was performed not as it was originally was by the person whose story it is, but by an actor and directed without input by the writer. So with that in mind, uh, I'd maybe like to open the discussion um, by first asking you, uh, Noel, and then Anne, um, if you could also comment on maybe why did you decide to perform your own story and uh, what advantages do you think that that offered? So, well, if you'd come in on there. Thank you. Um, well, the, the, first, I just want to say well done to Ellen, Ailish and Chloe. That was absolutely wonderful and it was great to see it. Um, it, it weirdly, I kind of the, the fashion in contemporary theatre at the time was actors were starting to create their own work. Um, and at 47, I just wanted a new challenge. Um, I didn't set out with the intention of writing a play about adoption at all. I went into a room with Michelle Forbes and a friend of ours, Louisa Carroll, uh, with a completely different idea. But the adoption story, the tracing all the years kept coming up. So they said, write that story. And I remember saying, there's no way I'm standing on stage talking about my life as myself. It's not going to happen. I was, it was far too terrifying. Um, but that's what happened in the end. And I remember Louisa ringing me during the period that we were devising the play and saying, look, I know you don't want to write this story, but just do me a favor and sit down and write a letter to your birth mother. And I did. And from there came the spine of the play. 
um, it's a very, very powerful thing to perform your own work. I came from the background of traditional theatre where I was used to having, you know, a fabulous costume, a character and someone else to blame if the words were terrible. <laughs> but when it's yourself um, and you're playing yourself and you're telling this deeply personal story, I have never experienced that terror. I mean, I knew about first night nerves and all those things, but it was absolutely terrifying, but also so powerful. I didn't know at the time what we'd written and the powers it had that it was a story that wasn't being told. Mm. My friends didn't know that I didn't have access to a birth cert or medical information or any of those things. So it was only walking out, I think, after the first preview and looking at people's faces and seeing my colleagues from theatre and people, you know, adoptees and birth mothers who came to see it, that I realised that this was a very, very powerful thing to write about and that the authenticity of me telling my own story had great power as well. There was a point in the rehearsal period where I went, let's just put it into, let's just give the character a name and I'll play someone. And we tried that and it didn't work. It just lost all its power. Um, so it's utterly terrifying, but I, I, I'm very glad I did it. And I mean, it began in 2013. The last time we did it was in London in 2020, just before the lockdown. And it mm -hmm. still resonates. It's still relevant. That's the really scary thing about it, because in my other life, I'm an adoption rights activist as well. And mm -hmm. it is still hard for people to access information or their birth certs, their identity, birth information. Um, so I'm very glad I wrote it. It's absolutely terrifying to do still. It's a little easier, but it's not a play that you can relax in. Um, and I kind of I'm delighted that I wrote it as a two hander as well. And um, I have Breedney Nocton alongside me, who's extraordinary. So, but you know, it, there is great power in it. And it, for me, it has turned into a piece of activism, it's still a piece of theater, but it's, it's, it's giving voice to stories that have not been heard, you know? Mm. Fantastic. I, I, I'd like to circle back on that in a minute about the kind of the power in, in terms of activism. And um, I guess in a way we, we can kind of talk about the last 10 years in terms of a huge amount of kind of personal narratives, particularly from, from, from women, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the power that that's had in, in, in really shaping our society in many ways in the last few years. But before that, I just want to, to ask the same question, if I can, to Anne, I guess, uh, who, who also uh, has a performance, I guess, directly about shaping uh, uh, some of the political realities that we live in. But Anne, if you want to come in on that, that same question, that'd be great. Well, thank you so much. Um, also, can I... I'm going to be echoing Noel a lot, so I think it's a very similar answer, but also on a just, I, I really miss applause, I miss, I miss giving it, I just want to send it to, all, to the entire creative team, that was really beautiful, very special, I feel very honoured uh, to have been able to share that today. Um, yeah, I started off working on my piece actually as a piece of act. It was a piece of, um, of kind of a canvassing play, I suppose, in 2015, and part of, I was doing a political theatre course, a kind of developmental um, a few months and I was like I wanted to put a kind of a human face to the marriage equality issue at the time um, and uh, I was like I, it's not going to be about me and I'm not going to be in it was uh, the two things I said and it became very clear as I you know the thing I kind of was railing against was what I probably really wanted or needed to do um, I I, I think I was so surprised I ended up writing my own story because I, I would have felt, I, why are we drawn to theatre? We all we all love dressing up, we all love hiding, we all love being other people, that's that's what it's about. And, I, you know, suddenly being yourself on stage, it seems like um, to be really against everything I'd been into theatre-wise. Um, and the, the first time I did it kind of at its developmental stage, it was before the referendum, and my parents came to see it. And uh, it was it was quite shaky. I was very very nervous because I was they were going to hear stuff that I had never told them, um, and uh, that, and as it went on, the play then developed into a full piece that I actually then after that was was like, kind of I gave them a bit of a please read this now and are you okay with this going out to the world, and I think. And I was very lucky that they, they said yes. Um, but I think what, what Noel um, is hitting on there, like it's just, it, it's very scary. And even though my show is quite, it's, it's a two-hander as well. And it's quite light because my co-performer especially has great comedic uh, timing. But um, at the same time, there's always a bit of terror because it's your own it's your own story there's nothing to hide behind there's, there's no one to blame there's no writer to blame there's no you know even I, I wouldn't go blaming the director or anything um and I, I 
it's always there's something very vital in, and exciting about it and I think with personal work like I know Ella wrote this in 2013 but there's something very timeless about personal work and I am and even with with my own story I feel you know it's always going to resonate coming out is always going to resonate with people um whether they're teenagers or or or, or 70 or 80 you know it's, it's just that kind of thing so I think true personal stories have a kind of, as I said a timeless quality and I felt even today watching watching that piece of work I was like this I, I this will this will last forever you know fantastic thank you both so much um I guess in relation to that 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 sense of of terror that you mentioned uh, uh Noel and then that that Anne kind of echoed there as well um, it's interesting that 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 both your stories uh, and Ella's as well, obviously, uh, is about. Um, they're certainly kind of they bring us on journeys of discovery, I guess, about yourselves, really, uh, on stage. Uh, so there's kind of a journey toward the self. Um, but I'm interested in the form because I guess that's something that's being explored today: is how does the the personal narrative form change as other people perform it? I guess. Um, but just before that, for you yourselves, when you were performing it and repeated performances, you know, in the introduction there, I, I spoke about how, how these pieces have been so successful and have connected with so many different audiences um, um, around the world, really, and, and, and nationally as well. Um, but as you performed it, was there ever kind of a sense of, of a loss of self or did you feel like that it became a performed self at times? Or we're interested in, in, in that negotiation that perhaps happens that, you know, uh, this idea that, that once something is kind of observed, it has changed. So once you yourselves kind of started shaping that performance, did you find that in some ways uh, there might have been a slight counter thing that even though the, that you're reaffirming identity, or maybe it might have been the opposite, that actually by performing it again, you, you, you found, found a sense of affirmation of identity. A very complex kind of <laughs> question, but you know, if, if 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 you can in any way comment on it in, in any kind of way, it, it's a really good question because uh, I mean I struggled with that. I don't know about Anne, but I really struggled with that. That sense of um, be the actor in the room, be the actor in the room. You know, don't bump into the furniture. Remember your lines. All those things when you are feeling so vulnerable, um, mm. and I think. I discovered when I, we did the first preview that I could actually do it. I actually didn't know what was going to happen stepping out there. Um, I think for me, the performance has deepened. I think I had such a responsibility about, and it was actually a friend of mine, Pat Kinavan, said it to me when I was having a nervous breakdown about doing it. He said, remember, it's not about you. It's about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a slight remove to go, forget it. You know, so they, they hate you, they hate you. Forget about it. What you're saying is where the power is and it's what's important. And I've always kept that on the nights where I still get very, very nervous or I feel vulnerable. And also, if the audience is filled with people who are affected by the issue, you can hear them, you can hear their reaction and stuff. But mm. I think it's as every time we do it, it's it's deepened. The performance has deepened, but not in a way that it's ever become glib. It's a it's a funny play. It's a sad play. But there's also trying to keep the balance that you never start to perform, you know? It is about the words. And we were always very careful, Connor Hanratty in the direction to go, if the audience want to cry, let them cry. Don't you cry. Mm. It's about giving the facts, keeping it really. And that's quite an exercise for an actor not to act and go, oh, they're gonna love this line or they're gonna love this or whatever. You, it's a different kind of discipline that you really have to hang on to <clears throat> because of the responsibility you have about what you're saying, you know? And so you have to kind of separate yourself and go be the actor now. And I found that something that I really struggled with even last year was separating the professional persona from the personal persona because they're so melded together. I don't know whether Anne had that difficulty as well. And you do have a lot of people have a lot of access to you with their stories and everything else. And it can be quite, you know, draining. It's, in, it's a privilege, but it's quite draining. So there's always that battle between professional persona and personal persona. Um, and as an actor, it's quite a workout, I think. I mean, I would recommend every actor to do it because it's a completely different world that you're in when you when there's there's nothing to hide behind. There's no, you know, there's no words that are not yours or anything like that. But I think it's a really um, good discipline for an actor to learn to go, I have to tell this story and not fall apart because there are moments still in that play that just really are hard to do each time. It hasn't gotten any easier, um, but it's, I think it's, 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 it's a good exercise, you know. 
I hope that makes sense. Sorry. <laughs> no, very, thank you so much. And Anne, would you have similar or different again? Very, very similar. <laughs> um, no, I, I think what's, uh, what was very key for me was like, you're still a performer, you know, you still have to perform it. And it's, it, you aren't just yourself on stage. You have to augment, you have to make an effort, you have to be bigger. Um, and there is a slight difference. I mean, Ella, Ella knows me really well and she's seen my show loads of times. And there is that difference between performative Anne and, and, and social offstage Anne. Um, but I think what's, what's really key is, is the team around you and the people who bring you on that process. And I, I, I think the people you choose to, to do that work with is, is very important because, um, I mean, Paul, Paul Mead directed my show and he's just, he's a very gentle, mindful um, uh, director. And there was just some moments where obviously, you know, our, the, all our shows touch on personal pain. And there was a moment we were rehearsing and it wasn't landing and, I just said, Paula, I actually can't run this bit again. And he said, oh, yeah, of course. You know what I mean? And that kind of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And I think having, having that, having a, a team around you who will, who will mind you to that, because, you know, it, it, I remember like saying, like, it's not therapy, you know, you're not, but you're, you're going through a cathartic process by doing this, but you've all, you're, and you are going to work out through things in this work. That's just the nature of it. Stuff's going to get better for you or, you know, or you have to face up to, you become incredibly vulnerable and there's such huge power in that vulnerability um but you do need to mind yourself in it and so i i do think anyone who's looking at embarking this work I, as noelle said I, I i recommend it uh it gets all your notions out of your head and also i think having paul was there talking to me about the language and he says you know there's a rhythm to this line of that and i'm like i wrote it <laughs> you know but he's right he he was a director and he was interpreting it for me and 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 I was an actor, um, and I think that experience is quite surreal and out of body feeling, but it's also really healthy uh, uh, to understand the form and to understand and to respect everyone in in that kind of artistic process as well as as the personal. Mm. And uh, I, an interesting thing in relation to all that, I guess, is to just come back is this sense that. Um, uh, well, you know, I mean, these are all your own personal narratives, but I guess this this festival that we're, we're part of right now is part of another larger work called uh, looking at the canon and the, and the curriculum, particularly at kind of the patriarchal way canons are formed and how, uh, you know, female voices have been have been marginalized, if not completely made invisible, I guess. And it seems that in the last 10 years, there's been um, with so much of these kind of personal narrative stories, not only in theatre, I guess, also the the the, the bestsellers of, of Emily Pine's work and uh, Sinead Gleason's work, um, that uh, the 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 power that you both speak of in terms of of the personal and it's always been, I guess, obviously a feminist mantra uh, that 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 the the personal is is political. But do you think that? Um, it just, you know, I'm, I'm an academic, so I'm always looking at the long view. <laughs> and in a sense, thinking of, uh, and it's where the, and I'm about to introduce and look at, look at the, the project itself today, but just what's lovely about having you two here today to frame the work is that sense of that there might be a moment where we really needed that kind of personal connection and the authentic voice of the person, there's a power in that, but that perhaps these stories can also have a, a later life as well without or removed without without the actual person telling those stories or well, that's something that we're exploring i guess today in, in the work and that that, that um chloe and ailish have been, have been exploring with, with ella who's, who's generously given of her piece so um do you have a comment on that do you think or do you, do you think you could remove yourself from it or do you have feelings on that after seeing the work today yeah it was great to see the work today because um i always felt because i wrote my own story and i was performing it that i shot myself in the foot that nobody else could do it because you know there isn't any other noel brands out there um and that's the name in the script but uh i, I was really it was really lovely to see that today to see ella's story told by somebody else and it's 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 powerful it works you know so in a way yeah i'm sure at some point i would like to think god oh, somebody else doing it but i think it would be, you know, I, I, it'd feel quite a wrench as well because it's so deeply personal. Um, but it, it is, um, I suppose, you know, 
there was more, I'm talking about the canon in terms of the patriarchy and stuff, mm -hmm. like on more than one occasion, people said to me, men primarily said, um, it's Pete, there's no men in that play. I mean, it would really, you know, we need to, and it was like, it's a story about me and my mother. Where, where is this, you know, and you know, and you just go, oh my God. But it's, um, those kind of questions do get asked. But also, I mean, I felt, you know, I was 47 when I wrote that play. Uh, and I remember at the time feeling, God, you know, written by two middle-aged women, starring two middle-aged women, you know, and there was a sense that was, there's not anything exciting going on over there. They're just really old and, you know, talking about their stories. Plus, it's a woman's story, you know, but it's not, it's a story. You know, there's lots of people, it's not all women who are adopted, you know what I mean? There are lots of adoptees out there going through exactly the same issues. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of, I'm getting closer to thinking, hmm, I, maybe it would be interesting to watch somebody else do it. In the beginning, I was like, oh God, no, I couldn't cope. But I think, yeah, I, I would be interested in that. Mm, thank you so much. And, and Anne? Yeah, I think there's sometimes this idea, say in literature, that literature is literature, and then anything written by women is niche. And, <laughs> you know, it's just nonsense. Stories are stories. I haven't thankfully had that experience of the wells like even though my show is two women as well um and i've had a lot of people of all ages and and genders come up and connect either because of family members their own experience so i think i've been i've been quite lucky with that but i it, the idea of, of handing it over uh i mean i think it's really healthy like i said at the beginning uh what's what terrified me was was what i ended up leaning into and i think it's scary, as you said, there's a wrench handing something over. Uh, I think it's just like, let's face it, it's like, well, I, <laughs> I want the gig as long as I can. But um, <laughs> at the same at the same time, I mean, uh, like what's the beautiful thing that can happen is you have companies all over the world performing your work. That's amazing. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I love the idea of um, two, two actors in, I don't know, Toronto doing it or in, um Malaysia or something like that's obviously an ideal and once you let go of art it has another another life and you have to be able to um and at some point I but I'd like to I suppose <laughs> still have the gig <laughs> not, not to be underestimated you know uh, um, even though you're doing all the all those those poor male actors who have no parts at all you know? <laughs> so, doing, you're doing them out of, out of jobs it's terrible um but uh uh, <laughs> uh I think what, what, I, what thank you so much and uh that's really framed some of the things that we, we can we can talk about now with, with the creators of today's show uh which was just so wonderful um so if I can if I can move the conversation to uh, to Chloe and uh, to Ailish, who uh, very life affirmingly are sharing a shared space together uh, for us all uh, um, on the screen, which is fantastic to see. Um, so I, I want to ask you a few things about the process and, and about your ideas. And then I'm going to finish uh, the kind of panel discussion uh, by, by going back to Ella uh, and some of her thoughts in relation to this as well. And then I'll, and then I'll open out, it out uh, via the chat for people if they can they can ask their questions. So, um, so first of all, thank you. I, I would echo what everybody else said. It was, it was really, you know, fascinating to see that this this performance done by other people, uh, and to see that the, the amazing kind of creative decisions that you were making. Um, it really struck me, I guess, that you kind of very much leaned into the constructed nature of the piece. That in a way, you were kind of from the very beginning. Ex kind of framing this as as a constructed piece by you know that that opening announcement of I'm I'm Ailish I'm an actress you know and I'm about to to perform this piece and then putting on the costume of, of the cardigan and in a way um all of the kind of uh almost Brechtian effects of the use of the projections the placards um all of those um uh devices that you were using um, the radio instead of the letters, which is, you know, I, I feel a thesis coming on just how you could <laughs> talk about that alone. Um, um, but, but I guess, Mike, to, to formulate this into a question and to, to, for you to maybe tell us about the process, obviously this is something that you, you wanted to do, that you felt to, to do with the piece was you were aware of it as being a, a personal narrative piece. And when you're confronted with that, you obviously decided to, to lean into the constructive nature. Would that be right? Um, yeah, so when we got the script, we knew it was a very personal piece and hearing that this was performed already and by the playwright herself and written by her and it was her life, um, we kind of took 
the approach that we can't go about this process like a normal play where normally you can construct this character and you can walk around and you can figure out their movements and how they walk and exactly how they think but with this it was a real person mm -hmm. and especially with COVID um, you can't have access to all the real props you can't have access to all the real objects that she describes that she owns um, so I think we really wanted to embrace that and mm -hmm. in order to share her truth to the fullest we needed to be true to that this piece is not her as well um, and uh, as well Ailish is half Ella's age do you know it's it's very obvious right in the beginning when she says hello I'm Ella I'm 32 that she is not Ella and she is not 32 <laughs> so we really wanted to play off of that and do it in a stylistic way as well so that it's it's still honest and you're still listening to the story and we really focused on what is the story telling and how can we tell yeah. that to the best of our ability on an online platform that keeps the audience with her and listening to her and so yeah do you have anything to say yeah I guess the most important thing um for me I suppose performing it was just making sure not to that the main focus for me was Ella's truth and I had only met Ella two times on two Zoom calls and I didn't really know her authentic self, but I knew how important this script was to her and I knew the weight of this story and I knew that it wasn't something that would you could mess around with, you know, um, and I think Chloe definitely helped me again it's different from a fictional character because you can kind of create your own version like it's it's deeper than that it's it, you're telling someone's story but you also need to try and make sure it's respectful to them you know what I mean um so yeah I think definitely using the props not the exact props that we had but uh, all those elements really helped us in a way because again one actor it's a little bit um different to having someone else's energy with you on stage and you can you can bounce off of that whereas like when it's just the one you need to be the decider of how that flow is and you need to be the decider of when to amp up certain emotions and stuff I suppose so yeah well thank you so much and and, and it, it worked very well and, and you know um there was there was a slight lag but actually um for well for me I don't know if it was for other people but uh what what that did actually as well is also kind of highlighted the constructed nature and the the gestural acting actually that was going on as well um uh and an interesting thing for me I guess and we'll hear from others now in a minute re reactions but was the the sense of um there because there, there's other real people in this as well through through the the, the letters and and, and uh, Ella's family etc but um was maybe the the kind of wider narratives that it was talking to in a way. Um, did you have a sense that by uh, the effects that you were you were using, that you were in some ways um, almost commenting on it or critiquing it as you were going along, or making it uh, less personal, or did you feel that that they they enhanced the personal side? You can go either way, I guess. But obviously, with with, with some of the Brechtian effects that you were doing, usually. The theories would say that that they're kind of alienation effects that make us into put us in more of a critical mode, right? Um, but also in terms of things like expressionism, which is, some of the things you were doing there would be that you maybe have more of a visceral experience to something as well. And, and I think you were playing off both of those things. Um, um, was that part of the design, or how do you feel? How do you feel about that? <clears throat> I think it was tricky because the the script is so realistic it when reading it it was like okay this is realism applied to the script but then I really wanted to take a different direction with the Brechtian aspects to it so it was kind of managing that and even going through the different characters you know we'd get up to the dad or Grace's voice or little quotes that they did and we'd be like all right let's come up with this voice here and we can't we can't share that story as if Ella is telling this personal story that happened to her we need to embrace that we have never met this father or Grace and we don't know how that would have emotionally affected us so we really wanted to play up that and dramatize it so that each of those little bits are almost 
exterior things that impacted Ella. So even the projector with the Winnie the Pooh, that Winnie the Pooh book is an exterior thing that impacted her life and is like this memory for her that we wanted to play off of. And even the voices, um, we kind of wanted to take that outside of the realism to show that this is an external effect impacting this character. Yeah. Um, and as well, like you said, how it's only one performer it's really tricky because you're not able to react to someone speaking that line to you. So we kind of had to make Ailish into five different characters throughout the piece, you know, where Ella is explaining all this stuff that happened to her, but then the dad comes in and says this, or Ella or Grace says this. And we kind of wanted to play off of that, of this is a one person show explaining all of her personal experiences. And we wanted to make those personal experiences more dramatized and able for the audience to experience them as well. So with the projections and the fashion wheel ad and everything like that, it's something that we could imagine Ella seeing and experiencing herself. And so we wanted to make the audience experience that as well. Mm -hmm. um, when none of us are able to know how it personally affected her. No one's able to fully experience that emotion with her. Except for her. Yeah. Except for her. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to play off of that and allow the audience to experience it in their own way. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. And I guess. So, uh, yeah. So I mean, the question of audience is kind of fascinating, and uh, obviously because you know one of the one of the the most distancing effects that you have is obviously that that it's through Zoom, um, um, and that actually we aren't together. We are together, but we're not. We're not not in the in the theatrical normal sense of things. And you know, one of those moments. It's very different. I mean, like you know, what was lovely is that you did direct it uh, uh, and performed it for this medium, and 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 you use the medium very very well. Um, but it is one of the things that really con contrasts with the the previous performance, in the no, sense I of uh, I mean, I know that that you guys deliberately didn't. There is a video that that Ella has of the original performance, but she didn't show you that. Uh, to deliberately keep you in the dark. I mean, when we bring in Ellen in a second, maybe she, she might talk to us about a bit of the original uh, performance. But obviously one of those moments that that's striking even for people that may not have seen uh, the, the earlier performances, they can imagine that in the theater, when you say, when, when we have that blackout, that that actually is, is very powerful in the theater where we're literally thrust into darkness. Whereas with you guys, uh, you didn't have that option in a way. Uh, you couldn't, we couldn't thrust us into darkness unless I don't know if people are, are watching this in a dark room. Um, and if they are, we're probably a bit worried about them. But um, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's those kind of moments that, that you had to do. So you never had full darkness. We still saw you in the darkness and we, we registered your fear uh, in, in, in that way um, rather than maybe, well, we felt it in different ways, I guess, rather, you know, with, with the different mediums. So that, that kind of fascinates me, which in a way cues me to bring in Ella. I think, and uh, if she's there, Ella, uh, uh, if if maybe if we if if you could start, Ella, by and first of all, just to, to you know the the bravery of putting your own narrative into the hands of other people um, is 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 amazing um, in itself, and then to to be able to have to comment on it now is probably even even more difficult. But just uh, to to maybe just ask you uh, to maybe give people a little bit of uh, an idea of the original performance might be a place to start and how things were different in, in, in between the two. Uh, yeah, um, so as you say, originally it was made in 2013 as part of Dublin Fringe Festival. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect. okay, good. <laughs> so it was made in uh, 2013 as part of Dublin Fringe Festival as I think, Noelle, you were up the week after me. Uh, so we didn't see each other's work in that in that one month. It was a couple of years later before I saw Noelle's show. Um, it was directed by Gina Moxley and it had been developed sort of um, initially between myself and my Amalgamotion um, uh, collaborator, Kira Tobin and Kim Porcelli, who I had worked with. Uh, she's an incredible uh, composer in, in Dublin. And she, she came with me then to the room with Gina and we started to develop the script in the room in DYT on days that I wasn't working over the summer, we would use the studio space there, which is a very small dark room in a Victorian house. Uh, so that probably had an impact on some of my design choices. Um, uh, a very a little tiny black box space. And, you know, we would just spend time once a week 
in the room working through it Kira Dan Kim and I had sort of tracked the three different stories that are happening there which is like my contemporary life and my hopes my childhood and then Henry and Nell which is that third and we sort of we had created little color-coded cards and so we used those as kind of little nodules to revisit in the development phase so they were kind of I talk about it like as as I quilt a lot so like when you're quilting you have different colored patterns or or like jewelry making they're each a different colored bead and you're stringing them together in different ways to to tell the story that has like a beginning a middle and, a, and, a, and an end um and so the original stage production was just me on on in a black box in the new theater and I come out on stage and I bring my crap with me my literal stuff my literal armchair my literal collection of teddy bears lamps sewing machines I, I actually when you say five there it, it hit me Ailish when you were talking about five sewing machines I currently have about 16 so that's grown <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 at an alarming rate in the intervening eight years um, but I, I literally and I was building this space around me with my physical things um and they and they were they're all real things and they were real to me and I wanted that's what I wanted was to sort of constantly be reiterating the realness of this because I do believe in the power of personal storytelling um you know and Anne and Noelle are talking about especially Noelle when you were talking about like not not wanting not want, going to write your story not you not going to be in it it not going to be the play that you went into the room to write I always felt like this was like a stopper in a bottle like I couldn't you know I had produced a lot of stuff I designed stuff I, you know, I'd, I'd made like short film pieces or immersive experiential pieces, but I really felt like I couldn't tell anybody's story until I, I could tell my own that, that, or I couldn't, I always want to share, share really personal stories. And I couldn't ask people to share with me if I hadn't been willing to share my own and to make it that public. How could I ask somebody to share, like, you know, my second play is about being a carer, which I also have an experience of being, but um, I very much for that piece when I developed it like spent time with other carers and talked to them about the things in their lives and and the sort of common points where we all meet um, but I felt so much more confident being able to say you know I've done this before and I've sort of really plumbed those dark corners those of, of dark experience and put it on stage and if I if I couldn't do that I could never ask anybody else to do it so it felt like the stopper in the bottle for me that I had to I had to do um, I haven't performed it in the same way that Anne and Noel have since. You know, it had an original original iteration. It had one other outing, um, and then it has this outing. But like, I haven't. I I still have such anxiety about performing it. It's still it's really hard. And even even I wasn't even performing at this time. I didn't have to do anything, <laughs> and I've been a nightmare for Ailish and Chloe and Kira because I I it takes me a long time to respond or to make decisions or to be able to vocalize how I feel about a suggested change or a suggested staging. It takes me a really long time. I find it really hard to to um, I wanted to be out there in the world, but I also find it really, really difficult to sort of watch it go into, into the world. I thought that would change. With Chloe and Ailish, um, I put a call out through the festival and they kind of came forward as a pair, which was ideal because I, I need both a director and a performer. Um, and like we said, we've had very little interaction. We've had like two Zoom calls. I didn't, they just got the script. They didn't get any production shots. They didn't get any notes. They didn't get the props they didn't get the, the recorded performance I really wanted to see and sort of explore because I wrote it and performed it and I know you and I Ian, Ian have talked about this about how much of the story and the character is resided in with me and how much resided in the script and a couple of weeks ago Chloe and Ayla shared with me um, a rehearsal for a couple not all the scenes but some of them and I was I, I was just so thrilled watching it because so much of it was so close to the original in terms of Ailish and Chloe's choices um uh, the the tone of the performance style of the performance you know their choices around simplicity and 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 just bringing things in and out um that I just I felt I was really thrilled on the one hand to learn that it is in the text that the the authenticity I suppose or the power the resonance exists in the text and and not in me as a performer which is great to know because now I, I really can send it off and not have to be with it all the time um 
and that you know that it had been there the whole time you know I wasn't consciously I wasn't I wasn't in academia at that time when I made the show so I wasn't thinking about about embodying embodying all of that into the text or 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 carrying it with me as a performer so to know that it exists and what I that what I wanted to come true comes through and today like really comes through like I think Chloe and Ailish did a really beautiful job and I'm so thrilled at being able to just walk away turn my back on it for a while and turn around and still see something so beautiful that they that they, they like they just did sterling work so I don't know if that answers your question I just talked about oh, that absolutely <laughs> uh, you know and I, I think you know everybody would be sympathetic towards uh your hesitancy on any decisions, uh, you know, the, the, the bravery that it takes to have your own personal story on stage. But then, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's the ownership that probably comes with that when you're performing it, but then to hand it over to people again, years later, uh, again, is, is, is uh, as I said, is, is, is something that's, you know, very admirable and, uh, you know, putting, making yourself vulnerable yet again, you know, which uh, again is to be, to be applauded. Um, I had this, <laughs> there's this almost this, this need, you know, these reaction videos that people like a lot. I have kids who love reaction videos, people reacting to things. I'd almost love to see the, 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 the reaction video of Chloe and Ailish as they see the video of your, of the original performance now <laughs> uh, and see how, how they would uh, uh, react. Because uh, as you said, uh, what was fascinating as well, and hopefully that maybe there's some people in the audience who have, who have seen both uh, performances uh, um, as well of the the continuity of choices that was there I think um, and then how some of them were translated into the different medium of the of this sort of online format versus the the, the theatricality or uh, the, the so much that was based in the original performance in, in terms of the present the presence within the theatrical space that you had um, like I mentioned with the with the blackout and so on but also the use of the real objects and um, how you kind of use the space. It was very interesting in the original piece, um, you kind of mapped out the stage with, with salt, was it? Yeah, uh, salt. Um, as, as, as you were talking about, and, and in this piece, we had the, the prop of the house and actually showing us the little pieces or whatever, but they both worked in very similar ways, you know, slightly different meanings as a result, but, uh, um, you know, and then the, 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 the was the, was there, much stage direction in the script that you gave to Chloe and to Ailish? I don't think so. I don't think there's much no. of anything in it. It's like 15 pages. I think there's there's a couple of stage directions about the lights going out and stuff like that, uh, but not a whole pile uh, is my recollection. I mean, <laughs> I, it, and it's so hard to tell because because I wrote it and I performed it, it was really hard for me to tell what is or isn't in there until I gave it to somebody else completely outside who hadn't seen it. Um, so I suppose... Like, Real people to answer that question are Chloe and Eilish, actually. Good, because one thing that was not there was 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 um, in, in Chloe and Eilish's, but it was there in a certain way. Is you, you've mentioned your sewing machines, mm. and there was the there was the projection of the sewing machine behind you throughout the performance, and of something being made yeah. uh, and stitched together um, throughout. But in a certain way, and it was even more obvious with the lag, you know there's sort of an editing stitching together going on in this process as well mm. um that that was there and that seemed to be kind of a, a similarity as well I don't know if, if Chloe and Ailish wanted to come in at all there if I yeah yeah sure um there weren't too many stage directions and some of the stage directs directions reading them I was like this is meant to be in a theater yeah <laughs> and we already can't do that um so I think in terms of the editing, it was like you said, Ian, about how the lights turn off and the audience is all in the dark as well. With the audience not able to experience that with Ailish, we needed to embrace the film aspect of um, doing this production. And before we were contemplating it, doing it live on Zoom. Um, and it was a really hard decision to make to decide that it would be pre recorded. Um, just because with theater during a pandemic there's I feel like there's this massive debate going on of okay then what, what is, is theater yeah. if yeah. it's during a pandemic is it the audience is it that it's live is yeah. it that it's a play it's it's really difficult to navigate and I think with this we really wanted to let the audience go through those feelings with Ella so we chose to do a lot of editing in terms of 
letting um, Ben, the videographer, film with us and go through those movements with us. Um, I don't know if that's answering your question. <laughs> I just realized there, but um, it was interesting, I suppose, for both of us as all we said this coming up to this call, like for us now, this performance is a bedroom theater. Like the intimacy of my single bedroom in Galway City is the perfect place for a story like this because I felt I could access those emotions because I was in my bedroom. Whereas like Fair Play to Ella, I do not know, and others who have done it in the past, like telling your own story in front of a live theater where mm. you don't know the faces out like be beyond you. It's a lot more vulnerable. Um, so having it in a bedroom this time around, obviously again, yes, the audience can't directly be in the dark with you, but using what we had and using like my salt lamp to light up my face that's why you could still see the outline of my face in that dark we just wanted to kind of get into how Ella directly would feel and see would the audience even gather that across the screen you know so mm. excellent thanks so much I'll, I'll open it now to the audience if they want to put in some uh questions to the to the chat and that's the way we can do this I guess uh and, and if they want to ask anything of, of any of the panelists or have any comments uh, on the whole process generally um, to put them in now. Um, yeah, just as, as Sarah has put in there, we'd welcome questions and comments. Um, and also just, I guess, while people maybe are processing and, and thinking about some, some comments, just to, again, to stress, if you can, and if, if, you, if you have not already, maybe fill out the survey uh, monkey link there as well, just for, um, it'd be really, really helpful for, for Ella's uh, research it, to, um, to, to answer some of those questions for us there as well to gather. Um, because while this was, was a, a finished piece as well, I guess it was also an exploration in, in how um, we look at these different things and how, how they change within the different formats and mediums and as a personal story is performed by other people as well. Um, so we just have a, a comment here from Kira Murphy. Well done all, such a beautiful piece. I'm wondering where Ella sees this going now. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I suppose the last the last week and sort of my raising anxiety level as we got closer and closer has, has sort of reminded me of, of why I haven't performed it again and why I just how awful this feels actually. <laughs> it really, like it's it's great to do it and then uh, we ha you have to push through. Not awful because I don't know, I don't know I, kept, I was talking to a Kyrgyz last week and she was like what are you afraid of and I was like I have no idea like nothing I'm not afraid it's going to be bad I've seen what the girls are doing and they've done a wonderful job I like it's already been out there it's been received I know it's a nice piece of theatre like I know it I know it affects people and people want to talk to me about about their own stories as Noelle says of, of being sort of that unofficial adoption that happens in Ireland and has happened for a long time um but I think I, it, I also feel really guilty that the piece has been locked away because I won't perform it. And so I think if I can if I can overcome the uneasiness of having to be so vulnerable, then I think hopefully it'll get it'll get a few more outings. I will say that when I initially developed the piece and it went on in Fringe and the playography, Irish playography from Irish Theatre Institute looked for a copy of the script and I said, absolutely not. No way. I don't want anybody to ever perform this except me. It's not a, it's not a character. It's not a script. So so this is a huge step. <laughs> uh, so we're getting closer to it being available to be in the world. Um, so so hopefully a bit more, but baby steps for me. <laughs> like I said, it takes me a long time. <laughs> well done. I mean, it also strikes me that, you know, Again, with the academic hat on, I guess, you know, we have anthologies of plays, but we might be able to have an anthology with the mediums that we have now of, 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 of the actual performers performing them. Uh, but again, maybe it would require that translation onto a digital medium away from the theatre and, and how will that work, etc. There's lots of other comments here that I need to uh, read out. Uh, so Anne House has such a beautiful touching play. I was totally in the room with Ailish. Uh, and Patricia Mitchell has a question here. She says, I really enjoyed the way the scene... I really enjoyed the way the scene where Ella was imagining running away from Grace's bed. How was that done on stage? Uh, bedroom theatre really worked there. Uh, so do you remember how that? How yeah, that um, I because I had my armchair and my footstool, um, I, I could kind of lie into the chair um, and I just would like I was just sliding slowly down off off the off the end of the footstool, getting my feet out of the bottom um, and just kind of slowly and then would just snap up into sitting. So it was a nice. It's kind of because with the, between the chair and the footstool together, it's kind of got a chaise long effect. So it gave me that that bed, that bed length that I needed to start that. Um, and yeah, I think the bedroom theatre, I think 
you know, because I mean, partly because of restrictions and, and just not being able to be in theater spaces, you know, but I know the O'Donoghue might have been available, you know, had we had we needed it. But I think Chloe and Eilish absolutely made the right choice to to set it in because intimacy was was part of that. The original choices were about, about black box. But then you like say you got to be intimate with me in that space. We don't have that. So now we get to be, you know, slightly more distant with Eilish, but in her intimate space, um, mm, which was really which is a really lovely choice really important choice I think in terms of um, yeah if it was filmed within say the O'Donoghue Centre or something like that it would have felt yeah a lot less intimate I think in those ways so I think that it was, it was a really fantastic choice um, if I can bring in just Anne maybe and uh, Noel as well please just just generally on, on, on your own reactions to the piece yourselves or, or anything that's that's happened at the moment through the discussion generally that we've had if you wanted to come in on anything there. Um, I just I was just wondering Ella was your heart like jumping out of your chest watching it like how did you feel watching it um less I'm, I, I'm much calmer once it started uh <laughs> and and like I said because none of that anxiety or that fear was about was about Chloe and Ailish and their process like I had you know I had complete faith in them from from the interim work that I had seen um and and just I suppose it's I don't know like I said I don't even know what it was I'm afraid of but but you know Noel when you talked earlier you were saying that you know about the audience being upset with you or being upset and and Connor saying don't you cry but let them cry and I think all of us who who have made this type of work have gotten that same note from our directors which is like you have to be detached you know so yeah. so for me the huge difference was Ailish was able to put a lot more emotion into those upsetting scenes then then that's a huge difference because she's not me whereas I think all of us who who were performing our own stories have, have sort of been schooled to have a detachment um yeah. that we don't get we that we I mean, there's a, a line at the very end of the show where I say, I'm OK, that last paragraph, I'm OK. And for so much of the rehearsal period, I was really not OK. <laughs> you know, I would be in floods of tears by the time I got to that line. And Gina was saying, you can't do this on stage. <laughs> the audience can't see you like this. You need to be OK. And so that transformative moment of repeating and repeating and repeating that by the time I staged the show, I was OK with this. Yeah. And, you know, I really feel that by making the show and performing it, I have reconciled with so much of that. It doesn't make me less anxious about performing it, but but I but I am completely okay with that part of my life and with having expressed it. And and when when Ian and I first talked about this iteration of practice, and you know when the performer is the writer, it's not quite and ha, you know it's not quite a theater of testimony or verbatim theater because you're I'm also a theater maker, so I can't unlearn those things. I bring them with me. But I'm also not just another person, you know, so so it's it's that at this point, it would be as wrong for me to perform that that character again. It's as far removed for me as it is for Ailish to perform the, you know, it's the yeah. same level of removal because I made the show in the first place. I will say Ailish, the the the, te the teddy bear, the forever friends bear. Um, so like the you stabbing that thing I just howled with laughter oh my I knew I just couldn't keep it together it was the funniest thing ever and I think because so many people so many audience reactions were like you have to get rid of that bear what are you still doing with that bear because it's the real thing that he gave me the day before he dumped me and I still had it like three years later and so to see you like take to it with a knife was so cathartic <laughs> <laughs> it really was just so like so funny and in a way I couldn't have done that on stage because it would have been too raw too emotional for the audience but to see you do it just made my heart sing I have to say <laughs> it's a beautiful story I, I mean I didn't I didn't know the story of the play I kind of had some idea of the themes but um it's so beautiful and again a story that we don't know about and it, it, it is a situ it was a very common situation in Ireland where children would just move in with someone or an aunt mm. or someone and that would be their life and it was as you said it was this unofficial you know moving between families and stuff um it's extraordinary i think it's a beautiful beautiful piece thank you noel thank you it's great and uh, yeah just just to, to to chime in there um i think what's really interesting about making this kind of work is especially when it's around pain um there is i don't know if you found this out but there is a process that when you when you get it out of yourself onto the page first and then maybe say it in front of a director or you say it in the room with other people and it starts to just get less heavy as the more you do it and 
as I said, it's not therapy, but it's healing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a healing process. You know what I mean? Healing for, for, for you, yourself in it. And I think it's, it's I, I'm, I'm just curious, because I know you said it's something you're, you're not, you don't necessarily want to do again. And something I've been very lucky, and I think Annette Noel has too, like I, I've actually had a chance to do my show so many times now that it's, it's become something different. But do you, would you feel that doing the show had that kind of effect for you where it, it light, lightened something within you or, or empowered you in, in, on a certain level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, that, that conversation I had with my mother where I asked for something very simple um, and, and just got so like shut down, like impacted me for so long. I couldn't, I couldn't ask for what I wanted for most of my sort of young adult life. And, and that breakup was entirely because I just couldn't ask for what I wanted. I couldn't, I, you know, I was trying, I really, when I talk about that, I heard it back, it, it felt like I, like I wasn't trying that hard, but I really was like, it was such a struggle for me to, to ask him for, for what I wanted and, and to be shut down again. So like was awful. And now I felt like when I, when I made the show, I always felt like I was, ex- I was having to apologize or to explain myself, you know, you know, the reason I don't respond well to, to, you know, this behavior or the reason I, I, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of crap, <laughs> like I have a lot of stuff, I'm not going to lie, but I always felt like I was having to apologize for it and explain it. And I don't feel that way anymore. You know, like if, if you've got a problem with, with my 18, 16, 15, so how many did I say? <laughs> 15 sewing machines, like go watch the play and you'll understand and come back to me then. It's not that, it's not that I'm, uh, like I'm, I'm reconciled with it you know this is just who I am and this is how I came to be that way and and I can't undo it and I don't want to I'm still like I'm you know I'm me I'm, I'm happy with me um but you know what I, I I'm not apologizing and I'm not I'm not making a den a, 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 you know adjustments for anybody anymore you know like this is this is it and I think the show definitely did that for me it was got me to the place where I was like this is just who it's not I don't have to fix it I don't need to be fixed I'm just saying this is who I am and if you want to listen that's great if you don't that's fine too it's that Um, opportunity to say it out loud I think because I remember when I was struggling with the the first time we did a showing of work of 20 minutes and I thought I was actually going to die and I thought I'll just say it out loud once and I'll never have to do this again but the 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 healing uh, I'm saying it out loud of going yeah. there it is out there all the stuff that's in your head or all the thoughts that you've had that you probably haven't shared but the power of actually it saying it out loud is is incredible like that I think that's where the healing is in a way I mean you don't magically feel better and think I've sorted all my crap now I'm grand <laughs> that's for sure I'm still a work in progress by a long <laughs> by a long stretch but there is that sense of I own this and mm. as you said accept it that's that's it that's where this came from and that's who I am and that's kind of powerful. I think we're very lucky as artists to have those platforms, you know what I mean? To be able to stand on the stage and do that because lots of other people can't. I would, I would say that like my mom and I have a, a, a very close, we're very close, like I live with her. <laughs> like we're still really close. Um, uh, but she has said, she has never seen the show. Actually, none of my family have. I, and I, I still won't let them. Um, I think my, my young, older sister might see the recording of this. Maybe I'm still not sure about it. Um, but she has said that, that, it released her like she knows I you know I talked her through what's in the show um I've told she obviously knows about it but but she said that she felt released from because obviously she'd had that experience with Grace as well that's mine is sort of a multi a cross-generational fostering yeah. situation but my mom had a much worse time of it in her childhood and that actually that she felt released from her own pain and also what she carries which is her pain of being my parent you know she can see the pain that I have and she knows that in some way she's responsible for it but that this that my being able to just do this released her from that as well so mm-hmm. so it's it's got that it's got that for my whole family to just be able to say this is I'm not hiding it this is this is the truth of our family and here it is that's a huge thing I mean is the responsibility you have like I was telling details of my birth family who I hadn't mm. even met and that level of responsibility and, and fear around it I mean I had a character and they're called Auntie Patty and on opening night my cousins who she's their mother rang and said we're on our way and I was like <laughs> and I said look there's a character called Auntie Patty in the play please it's not her it's not her you know but the power of it I'm thinking am I going to get sued you know all of that and the emotional you know will will your family be okay and I thought well if anybody objects to it and says you cannot do this then I may not be able to do this play ever again even if I wanted to 
but that responsibility is is something you don't come across as an actor if you're just playing a part in a play it's all the world outside of it and the people that might be offended or might be upset and think you shouldn't do this and I think that's quite a quite a challenge as well I think it definitely well, is it's just it's around your intentionality as well like mm. if if the if the piece of work you're making is a piece of revenge then you've got to yeah. be prepared for what's going to come at you but like your work this play is very much it's a, it's it's just telling a story and even at the end it's i'm okay it's not you know you aren't shaking your fist at at the sky or at anyone and i think intentionality like it's it's a funny thing with my own show so just like my my parents struggled a lot with my coming out and they both said to me afterwards, you know, you know, your show is very kind. You were very kind to us in it. And I, I was just relieved about that because there, there, uh, there's a lovely thing that can happen in real life, uh, real work, where um, there was a moment in the show where I refused my dad a slice of cake because um, he voted no. And then in, on the opening night of the show, he was in the front row and I had the cake in my hand and I just said, you want your cake now, Dad? <laughs> and the audience, and that's obviously a theatrical thing that can only happen in a very specific moment <laughs> and people are like oh can we bring him on tour with us and I, was like, well, I can't really but I think so, like the point being really for what you've made Ella it's a very it's a very beautiful heartfelt piece of work but it is very deeply kind you know and it's it's very there's a sense of healing and 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 it doesn't pull any punches as well and I I really I suppose I advocate for you to continue to get it out there into the world, whatever way you can. And I understand your hesitation, but as a member of the public, like seeing work like that's really good for us. And uh, I just think more of that, please. Well, I, I think we have to end it on that line, don't we? Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, uh, to all our panelists today um, and to, to the makers uh, of, of the piece today as well. Um, it's been a lovely experience uh, to share this and it's been a lovely experience, I think, for, for all, all here. And there's, there's, there's comments to that effect there as well. I didn't get a chance to read them all out. Um, but thank you to all for uh, attending today. And I don't know, it's impossible to, to say goodbye as an Irish person anyway, but on these <laughs> things, it's, it's, it's even worse. Uh, um, but uh, <laughs> we need to do that. So uh, thank you all. Uh, I hope everybody has a pleasant evening and please attend more of uh, the, the Festival of New Work uh, to see more exciting shows, but also if you could uh, also fill out that survey and uh, uh, th there might be an email sent out in relation to that as well it would be really really helpful to progress this kind of uh, uh, research and, and and to see more of this kind of work so thank you so much thank take you. care bye bye thank Thanks, you so everybody. much bye